Thank you. That's very nice of you. <laughs> All right, now, does anybody have an opposing viewpoint? <laughs> Boy, you got him wired tonight. Yes, nice. Do you let him into your limo and your bar car? <laughs> <laughs> nice looking audience. I can only see about the first six rows. Now I can see the rest of you. Didn't I see this group at Reverend Moon's coming out party? <laughs> well, I'll get to you in a minute. Anyway, thank you for coming tonight. We have a real good show for you. It should be exciting. We may come up in the audience later, see how you are tonight. I had a, uh, I'm recovering from a rather strange experience driving in from Malibu today. One of those big RVs, recreation, recreation what do you call them? Yeah. Big RV. Yeah. Forced me to the side of the freeway, and a guy leaned out and asked me if I had any Poupon mustard. <laughs> Weird. Anyway, we are in uh, Burbank, California. We like to uh, mention Burbank because that's where we are. It's also you from Burbank? Are you? Are you from Burbank? No. Oh. <laughs> is there anybody here from Burbank? Hey, All right, we, we kid the community. It is uh, n sedate, would you say? Yes. Um, a little older community. Give you an give idea. Have you seen the two old guys in the uh, Bartles and James commercials? <laughs> In Burbank, they're considered hunks. <laughs> hey, we got a big show tonight. Chuck Yeager and Tommy Newsom, the right stuff and the wrong stuff. <laughs> All right, huh? very nice. Very nice tonight. Thank you. I'm not gonna. No, you do look. You look. You, you should be in front of that band. <laughs> Where's Doc tonight, by the way? Doc is in San Francisco, uh, playing with Al Hurt and Pete Fountain. Oh, good. Good. Okay. Oh, interesting thing in the paper. I talked about this last night. They were trying to set a beer limit at baseball games. They think too many people are drinking too much beer. There is now a true beer limit at Dodger Stadium. Ed went to the game the other night, had a, two St. Bernard kegs around his neck. <laughs> anyway, I didn't read too much in the uh, paper today in the sports section about, you know, the problems they're having in baseball, but apparently Steve Garvey, they searched his luggage today and found a two-ounce bag of raw Ovaltine. <laughs> Anyway, as I mentioned, the Reverend Moon is uh, out, out of prison, as you probably know, and apparently Reverend Moon wasn't too popular in prison. He used to walk along death row saying, have a nice day. <laughs> How many of you know that there's a, new, a Rambo doll on the market? You can buy it. And they now have a Jerry Falwell doll on the market. You wind it up and it sticks its nose into everybody else's business. <laughs> Just send the letters here, it's okay. <laughs> I don't know, I wonder about a reverend who does all his shopping through the Sharper Image catalog. But what the hell? Anybody from New York here tonight? <laughs> New York has the hottest ticket in the United States. They have a lottery in New York, as you know. You know what the first prize is now that they're drawing for? $41 million is the top prize in the New York State Lottery. They're selling tickets at the rate of 20,000 tickets a minute. Yeah, and the odds in winning are six million to one. And they got people lined up for blocks. It's kind of frightening seeing Mayor Koch and a bag lady fighting over, <laughs> fighting over a place in line. One guy was really disappointed. He thought he was in line for a Bruce Springsteen ticket. <laughs> now, California lottery is supposed to start, was supposed to start about a year ago. Yeah. But officially begins, I guess, the tickets are going on sale soon. But we already have high stakes gambling in California. It's called trying to get on a freeway during the rush hour. Right. Here's... Now, here's... here's the most exciting news of the day. Dr. Ruth Westheimer, who is in the... Has... Now, get this. You've all familiar with Dr. Ruth? Okay. 
She has a new board game out <laughs> called Dr. Ruth's Game of Good Sex. And it's apparently a lot like Monopoly. And uh, <laughs> the object of the game is to win enough money uh, to buy good sex, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, if you miss foreplay, you go directly to jail. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of fun. I'm gonna get... I'm putting out my own sex game, board game, called Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, we have on the we have on the show tonight one of the funniest men in the business, Mr. George Carlin. And a gentleman who probably does not like the word at all, a hero, he has a def different definition of hero, but he is probably the best pilot, certainly in this country, and possibly in the world, General Chuck Yeager. So stay where you are, and we'll be right back. Stomping off on the way to your other show? <laughs> I get the feeling you just come here to pick up your mail. No, no. And then go to bloopers, and then go to Star the Search, and then go to do the commercials. All the way. All right, we're going to go up in the audience in a second, but I, I must read you this letter. Now, as you know, you are a spokesman for... American Family Publishers. Uh, publishers, yeah. and as you probably know, a lot of these things are done by computer. All of them. In other words, uh, they get up mailing lists, and they're fed into a computer. Uh, and the name is printed in, and you get this rather personal letter, but they leave space to put in what they believe to be the first name of the person, mm -hmm. right? Now, if they have Ralph Courtney, you'll get this letter that says, Dear, and then it'll say Ralph, and then the rest of the, mm -hmm. the, the copy is pretty much the same for everybody. I got this from a viewer, and apparently he was the head of the Association of uh, Citizens or something, mm -hmm. but all the computer picked up was the word association and the abbreviation. And we all know what that is. So, no, it is printed here, so I don't want you to say I'm trying to do this just to, for, for, for a cheap laugh, although I have been known to do that, too. <laughs> You'll certainly accept it. It says, if one of the enclosed numbers is a grand prize winner, and on the top of it it says, ass is guaranteed... <laughs> Now, the more you read this, the funnier it gets, because it's supposed to be this personal letter. Dear ass, I'll be handing you a prize, all right, if you're a grand prize winner. The only question is, will it be just $5 million, or will it be more? And the only one who can answer that question is you yourself, ass. <laughs> yes, ass, you're guaranteed. $5 million by returning the grand prize winner before the gold seal date. Here's my favorite. We're talking big money, ass. <laughs> oh. They're trying to be so personal here. How much grand prize money do you want, ass? And it goes on and on and on. Anyway, I should point out, it's done by computers as most mailing lists are in the country are, and the computers just, what's the old saying about computers? Garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you feed the computer, they just print yeah. it out. But nice huh. personal letter. <laughs> <laughs> the folks won't be laughing when ass is a multimillionaire. <laughs> All right, somebody else sent me this one. I don't know whether you can see this or not. This is from a fellow by the Noel Williams of Arlington, Texas. And he says they were in the Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and, uh, during uh, the shopping, uh, this is in a shopping center. And apparently, these signs are very close to the restaurant signs. But if you look at them closely, they thought this was rather amusing. It says, men's room. And if you go in closely on the sign right by it, seating capacity, 300. <laughs> You're 
talking about a busy shopping center. <laughs> All right, have we got to... We'll do the commercial first, then we'll come up and we thought we'd play a little uh, Stump the Band with our audience tonight. So uh, stay where you are, we'll be right back. Some fabulous prizes, I guess. <laughs> or anybody, well, we have, even if you don't stop the band. Anybody got a song? Anything? Oh, we'll, we'll start here with this lady. You mind standing? Okay. And you are? Valerie Sorter. Where are you from, Valerie? New Jersey. New Jersey. Did you know? New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. Did you know that New Jersey and New York are fighting over who owns the Statue of Liberty? But New Jersey won. They did win? Yes. Yeah. Would they come over and threaten them? That's right. <laughs> Give me the statue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, have, have a few, did you? <laughs> That's all right. I'm just teasing. What do you do in What do you do in New Jersey, Valerie? I'm a teacher. Your teacher? What grade? Uh, kindergarten. Kindergarten. Oh, I don't envy you. Okay, what's the name of the song? Can I just do one thing before? Uh... Well, I don't know, Valerie. What <laughs> What'd you have in mind? My mother asked me to give you a kiss if I got on. The show. Really? Yes. <laughs> my best to mom. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Today's your birthday. Well, happy birthday. <laughs> uh, I hope you didn't mind that. I'm just a silly mood tonight. Okay. I'm delighted. I'm, I live alone, you know. <laughs> What's the name of the song? Pussy Willow song. Excuse me? The Pussy Willow song. Pussy Willow song. Pussy Willow. What do you want from kindergarten? Well, I just... <laughs> And you guys ever go to kindergarten? No. How about the third grade? Fourth grade? <laughs> Pussy. Fifth grade? Any... Oh, she wouldn't. Your girlfriend says no. Fifth grade? No, you're on your own. Uh, Any of you guys know the Pussy Willow a... song? Uh, some of them w were referring to that earlier, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. Valerie, could you... <laughs> could you sing just a few bars of that? Just a few. I know a little pussy, her coat is silver gray. She lives down in the meadow, not very far away. <laughs> She'll always be a pussy, she'll never be a cat. That's the one. I think we had it. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we, <laughs> we have dinner for four at the Parkway Grill in, in Pasadena. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Anybody else? Okay. And you both rise as one. Are you, are you together? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. And you are? Vicky. Vicky and? Debbie. Are you related or anything? No. Uh, where are you from? Ventura. Right here in California. See. What do you do in Ventura? We work at the Highway Patrol. As dispatchers. Aha. Uh -huh. The arm of the law is here. And the leg of the law, too. Uh, <laughs> what, what does a dispatcher do? Tell cops where to go. You tell the police cops where to go? Good. A lot of us would like to do that. No, just kidding. What's the name of the song? You gonna do this together? What's the name of the song? Jan Janssen. Jan Janssen? Do you know Jan Janssen? We've decided they've already won. <laughs> Give them the dinners. Jan Janssen, okay, ready? Mm -hmm. My name is Jan Janssen, I come from Wisconsin, I work where the vinegar works are. Oh, oh. All the people I meet when I walk down the street, they say, hello, what's your name? <laughs> then I say, my name is Jan Janssen, I come from Wisconsin, I work where the vinegar works are. All the people I meet when I walk down the street, they say, Hello, what's your name? Oh. Then I say, My name is Jan Janssen. <laughs> it goes on forever, doesn't it? 
Does anybody have a song with one verse? Every song is 19 verses tonight. Okay, dinner for four at Stratton's Restaurant in Westwood Village. Thank you, Thank you gals. Okay, we'll be back after this. Here we are. Yeah. In a little while, General Chuck Yeager will join us, but right now, here's probably one of the most popular comedians working anywhere today. This Friday, the 23rd, uh, George is going to be in San Diego at the Civic Center. On Saturday, the 24th, he'll be in Denver at the Rainbow Music Hall. Sunday, the 23rd, he'll be in Colorado Springs. And earlier tonight, his first half-hour comedy special called Apartment 2C premiered on Home Box Office. Would you welcome Mr. George Carlin? <laughs> How you doing? Everybody okay? Good, good. I'm feel I'm a little nervous that I just started shaving my legs, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm gonna like it or not. You know what you never see? A wino with perfect pitch. <laughs> Do you ever eat chicken at lunch? Do you ever have like eat chicken at lunch and then you eat chicken again at supper time? Do you ever wonder if the two chickens knew each other? <laughs> Think about those things. <laughs> Same, another thing about lobsters, you know, lobsters are the only thing we eat that we have to kill them ourselves. Uh, that is, you know, if you bring them home, you gotta kill them. You don't have many foods like that. Most things come to you dead. Not lobsters, you gotta kill them. But you know, that's the only reason you can drop them in the water is because they look like that. If they look like puppies, you couldn't drop them in the water. <laughs> Did you ever wake up in the morning and realize that so far everything has happened prior to now? I just realized I don't know anybody named Griselio Bambaluzzi. <laughs> I'm gonna have to widen my circle of friends. Today, you guys will be interested. I ran into Bo Diddley. Yeah. <laughs> he laughs at anything, you know. But it's true. It's true. Well, Bo Diddley and his brother, Dudley. Dudley Diddley. You know him? The whole family. Vincent Diddley, Dudley Diddley. And it's a little strange talking to the Diddleys. <laughs> yeah. When you have to introduce the Diddleys, and then Betty Boop came along, and I had to introduce the Diddleys to the Boops, you know. You feel a little strange. You know what I would hate to be? I would hate to be a Q-tip, really. How would you like to be a Q-tip, you know? Lying in the box, hoping it's not your turn. Wondering where they're going to put you. <laughs> I'd want to be one of those ones that fell on the floor and you have to throw it away. <laughs> oh, yeah, the future consciousness. Good. <laughs> You're strange. I only do one impression. It's Jackie Stewart, the Scottish racing announcer from ABC. Can you say American Broadcasting Company on this network? I guess so. Jackie Stewart here. We're at the Talladega 500 and there's a car on fire in the far torn. We don't know whose car it... Wait a minute, it's Mario Andretti's car. <laughs> here comes AJ Foyt. Here comes Bobby Unser. Here comes Kel Yabro. <laughs> okay, that's all good. Give me that for you, guys. Sure, I like that. Look at that car. Hey. You want to have a little fun? Go in a gun store, buy a gun, then buy some ammunition, then ask them if they have any ski masks. <laughs> I've noticed that a lot of singles bars are getting kind of cutesy names. Singles bars have names that end in S, you know, like chuckles and giggles, tramps and scamps, cahoots and all that. I'd like to have one called nipples. Wouldn't that be a good one? <laughs> Well, I just want you to know, everything is going okay in Lebanon. I noticed today a peacekeeping force bombed some religious people, so they're doing all right. <laughs> you know, it's really dangerous when people who have ancient hatreds get a hold of modern weapons. But then... <laughs> I admire, I admire Pegleg Bates, because all he ever wanted to do... <laughs> all he ever wanted to do was follow in the footstep of his father. You know what I mean? <laughs> and here's some... <laughs> this is something strange. 
Edwin Teller, I saw a picture of Edwin Teller. He invented the hydrogen bomb. He had a tie clip on. <laughs> that strikes me as silly. I mean, a man who would invent something that would blow up things for 50 miles was worried where his tie was. <laughs> you know, that's not a funny one, that's a serious one, okay? <laughs> what happens if a really stupid person becomes senile? How do you know? <laughs> it's a strange thing. Okay. Do you ever notice when you leave somebody, they give you a message to give to someone else? Like, give my love to Klaus. Tell Klaus Rebecca sends her love. Do you mind that? Do you mind the awesome responsibility of having to carry Rebecca's love to Klaus? <laughs> Suppose you don't see Klaus. What are you gonna do with her love? Carry it around? <laughs> give it to someone else, maybe. Wilhelm, I can't find Klaus. Here's some of Rebecca's love. <laughs> Can Wilhelm legally accept Rebecca's love? especially when it was originally intended for Klaus. <laughs> Suppose you give Wilhelm Rebecca's love for Klaus and then you see Klaus. What form should the love take? <laughs> Can you risk giving Klaus a tongue kiss? <laughs> Which brings up another problem. Maybe Klaus is gay. <laughs> Klaus doesn't want Rebecca's love. Klaus wants Wilhelm's love. <laughs> Now, some people don't send their love, they send their regards. That's not as important, is it? Some people just send their regards. Give my regards to Dave. Do you always give the one they want? I don't. I decide at the last minute which one the person ought to get. They might say, give my love to Dave. I might not feel Dave is deserving of love. I'll whip a few regards on Dave and keep him in his place. If I really don't like the person, I'll drop the message way down. Someone might say, Tell Dave Susan sends all her love and can't wait to see him again so we can make love all night. I'll say, Dave, Susan said hello. <laughs> but it's better than just getting someone's best. Sometimes people just send you their best, you know. They'll say, give Dave my best. Your best what? <laughs> Frankly, Susan, if this is your best, why not keep it to yourself? <laughs> It's a little bit better than being remembered to someone. That's hardly even worth telling anybody. Remember me to Dave. I say, Dave, you remember Susan? Yes, well, that's it. That's my job, I'm all done. I've gotta go see Julio and tell him Franco said hello. And I've gotta go over and see Johnny and tell him Merv says hi, so I'll see you in a little while over there. <laughs> You sneak a couple of those in just to see me go under the table. I'd like to hear that, yes. You know what I did the other day? I had your album on in the car, the cassette, mm -hmm. one you did in college about the, the, the long thing you do on drivers. Yes. And you're talking about the worst driver is the one that looks through the steering wheel. You know, you just see the head. Yes. And don't trust any man who wears a hat. Over 60. And just about the time yeah. I look up and I see a guy coming this way, and all I see okay. is this little, <laughs> this little right. tennis hat, and I almost drove in the ocean. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I pull over and take public transportation. I was about ready to sue you. Yeah. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. I see your, your mind is still working in strange, quirky ways, which is it's always good to know. I love cleaning out my file. That's what I do. I like to do a series of things unrelated here. Yeah. And I usually just look through and get the big fine tooth comb out and find the strangest a stuff I can. concert of non sequiturs. Yes, that's it. Yeah. The, the HBO thing was on tonight earlier, but it's, yeah. I guess it's going to play during the week on HBO. Yeah, they, right? they, they show it about five times in the month of August. The next so what is it, sitcom or well, Apartment it, 2C? It's, uh, yeah, Apartment 2C is the name of it, and it's... Um, it's, an, it's a sitcom in that it is a situation, and it's a comedy. So, hey, <laughs> the only thing missing is the hyphen. That's so right. we'll figure That's that out. Right. But it is a sitcom. I, I live, I play an artist. I use my own name in it, but I play a writer. I say artist. It's a form of artist. I play a writer living alone in an apartment in New York, right. apartment 2C. And as any sitcom has, I have a, a lots of strange neighbors, neighbors course, folks coming right. to the door. Not always neighbors, sometimes uh, uh, salesmen, solicitors, what have you. Right. And uh, it's really loaded. Our company did it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a pilot and it's not a pilot. Uh, they said if it really goes through the roof, they'll, they'll like to do it as, as a series, uh, however right. many I don't know. 
But I don't know. They seems to change their policy every yeah. couple of months there about whether they do series or not. Yeah. Either way is okay with me. It's a terrific show. I yeah. like it as it is. I would be willing to just, you know, retire yeah. on that. I'll watch it this week. It's, what else is new in your life? Well, I want to tell you a little about... Uh, can I mention one more thing about sure. Apartment 2C? Because yeah. they wouldn't let me show a clip, Johnny. You know what I mean? Hey, man. No, I, they I like, they wouldn't let me show a clip on here of my show. 18 years, I've been coming here, paying my dues. Why you know you, what I mean? Why is that? Because it's not an NBC show, or it's not a movie. They show movie clips. Well, that can't be the reason. But instead of a clip, I brought some drawings of the show. Ah, <laughs> a first, a first, yeah. Yeah. Drawings uh, are all right. Yeah, these are some drawings like they used to do with the uh, courts, you know, before they could get TV cameras in there. This is, uh, like I say, this is me answering the door. <laughs> Funny. Walking over, this is the door. The door opens and... The door opens, and look, here's the reverse angle. Ah, that's right, so you can... There's one of the neighbors outside, outside. waiting to come in the door. And this is a piece of paper that fell uh, down there while he was outside. Uh, then this is me inside the apartment talking to another neighbor. This is a woman. Maybe uh -huh. you can see that. Uh -huh. Little graphic for our show, but I have my hands on my hips there, kind That's of. Good. I can't believe it. That's you know, cute, something yes. like that. This is either a double oven or a window. I forgot. Just something. And then one, one close-up. I want you to have a close-up to see. This just, is, your, uh, just your left kind of eye. One of those European arty shots, you right. know. And that's the same door that matches this door from the first shot. That's very good. And we, we had some outtakes. We we're getting, some, but oh. they're still in the art department being done. So, so the outtakes. When they're done, we'll send them over for bloopers. Bloop, all right. That's, that's exciting. And, and, and a first. Yeah. And a yeah. first on our it's, um, by the way, yeah. I, uh, Listen, I, want to, I used to always hate when people would, would plug their families on TV, but I want to do that now. Your daughter's So I've show. changed my mind, yeah. Uh, my daughter's on this show, and she's terrific, and, and my wife is one of the co-producers. Molly Miles and Brenda Carlin are our co-producers, and I just right. wanted to uh, make sure that was on the record. That's nice. A family that yeah. produces together... Stays together. Or produces together. Oh, right. I don't know. I have no finish for that, but... I'll be right here. We'll work on a finish for that, and we'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> General Chuck Yeager is an extraordinary individual, and if I just sat here and listed all of his accomplishments, we would be here way till tomorrow. But uh, he was a fighter pilot in World War II, shot down five Messerschmitts in one mission. He was shot down in Nazi Germany. He was the first man to break the sound barrier, flying the Bell X-1 on October 14, 1947. He became the first man to fly more than twice the speed of sound on December 12, 1953. Um, he is probably the best pilot in the world. And he's had an extraordinary life, and it's a pleasure to welcome General Chuck Yeager. I sat up late last <laughs> night reading this saga of your life. Why did you, you've, uh, you've been a, I know you hate the word, a legend in this country around the world for many years. Why did you decide to wait all this time? With a, to put well, it down. Actually, Mr. Ballantyne from Bantam Books uh, yeah. asked me to do a book, and uh, I already had most of it in uh, the Air Force uh, oral history program, right. and we got Leo Janos to sort of put third people in, and he put it all together and put it on paper, and it was a piece of cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is a fast... You've had an absolutely extraordinary life, and, and, and the thing that absolutely amazed me in reading this book last night, being a test pilot, that you're still around after all these years, and... You, <laughs> and and I think you point out in there about the best pilots are the most experienced ones. Well, right? Johnny always had a policy, man. It's never let him name a street at Edwards after you and never let a pathologist examine you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you reminded me, and I'd almost forgotten it, but yeah. you were on The Tonight Show in 1964, 21 years ago. Yeah, 64. You were, yeah, you were narrating... Um, some piece of film, I believe. Yeah, we, the one of, we put together at Edwards that showed the X-1 and some of the X-1A tumbling and, and all the new programs we were working on. That's, we had a good time, you, yeah. you recall. Yeah, I'm glad to see you can still flare your nostrils in I the audience. I still do that a little bit, yeah. <laughs> 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 to the person who does not fly, how do you describe the, the exhilaration, the feeling that pilots have, all really superior pilots, um, Sometimes you cannot express the, the is it, what is it, the exhilaration is it the is it the closeness to danger the no, challenge or what I think uh, it's just a feeling that when you accomplish a job well uh, uh, 
that's, you know, like when you put on a good show every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. Uh, yeah, occasionally we luck in. We uh, <laughs> we don't take it in, as you say in the in, in the book. No, uh, Johnny, the feeling at uh, number one, uh, like in combat in World War II, when we right. were fighter pilots, uh, you learn to discipline yourself and concentrate on what you're doing, so right. you, so you're not scared and you don't worry about the outcome. And uh, like the X1, probably is the most useful thing that I ever did was breaking the sound barrier because it was sort of a barrier there and we were never able to get above the speed of sound right. during World War II or a little later. And I think it's just, just you know, if you've got a job to do and you do it and you do a good job, you're happy with it. So. Yeah. You, you point out there in the, uh, in the X-1, it was you were riding actually just like a, a large load of fuel, weren't you? Yeah, we uh, setting against about a 300-gallon tank of liquid oxygen. It was really cold because, uh, you know, it's, you're in a pressurized cockpit and uh, alcohol on the tail and uh, it was a rocket airplane and they dropped it from a b-29 mothership because we only had two and a half minutes of fuel we burned up 600 gallons when we used all four chambers in the rocket motor right but that that was the only way we could get the airplane above mach 1 actually we didn't have jet engines in those days that uh, gave us enough thrust to get it yeah. above mach 1. every time you fellows go out test pilots you are actually experimenting with you say, a prototype as you say in the book it's an unproved aircraft, generally, and, you're, and your job is to take the, the damn plane up and find out what its limits are, right? What it will well, do, what it won't do, and to take it almost to the point where you might tear it apart. Well, normally, you know, they, call, they talk about test pilots. Uh, there's many varieties, right. like a production test pilot, experimental, or right. uh, research flying is where you're flying an airplane where no one else has ever been, like right. the X-1, the X-1A, and, right. and the X-15, and others. But the, the point is... Uh, you, they, they talk about the envelope, you know, the pushing the out, outer edge of the envelope. Mm -hmm. as call it. We, we use a rectangular square to talk about performance of an airplane. On the right side is speed, and the top is altitude, and, of course, the max speed on the right, minimum speed in the ground, and altitude. And when you're working in the upper right-hand corner, that's at maximum speed and that maximum altitude. When you get outside of it, you're pushing your airplane a little farther than it's designed to go. Right. And uh, that's the expression we use. And uh, normally, that's, an, that's a test pilot's job and, or a research pilot's job is to develop the parameters or the limits at which an airplane right. should operate. And that's, uh, that's your job. Are you ever truly scared in, in, in what you do? What? No, I, th I think we learn real quick, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, you obviously don't waste an awful lot of time thinking about something that you have no control over. So put it out of your mind and concentrate on what you're doing to stay out of that region. And, right. and you're a little bit worried, like, like combat missions, uh, like in World War II, you'd be a little apprehensive when you'd brief you brief you on where you're going on the mission. You know, if it's a low-altitude strafe mission in a, in a real heavily defended area, you, th you have a little squeezy feeling. But once you strap your fan in the airplane and fire off, then you have no... No, th no more thoughts about it. Yeah. You're working on it. So. As you pointed out the book, you say what an aircraft is, or at least <clears throat> uh, is, is really a, a gun platform. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a platform to fire weapons from, so you have to have stability. But you said when you were flying in the Second World War, you might have had 50 pounds of electronics mm -hmm. in, say, the P-51. And nowadays the ships, the, um, the F-16, the, the, the F-20, yeah. uh, have something like 1,500 pounds yeah, well, of electronic a, gear to look at. Funny, I remember the first airplane I shot down, it was on March of 4th, uh, 44, I used a ring and bead gun sight, which, you know, just instinct. Right. You just like shooting a shotgun at a bird. But today, like in the F-20, you, you have a weapons management system that's uh, really fabulous. And it does, you got a computer systems aboard and uh, it does everything for you. It doesn't take you out of the loop because it still responds to your, your input when right. you're flying the airplane. But I tell you, with the weapon systems that are available today and the technology that's going into airplanes like, like the F-18 and the F-20, right. it's really fabulous what you can do with them. You still go out and fly those ships, don't you? Yeah, I work <clears throat> uh, for Northrop uh, as a consultant test pilot on the F-20, and I stay pretty current in, uh, in modern technology. So. Yeah, now they say flying's a young man's game. You were the, I think, one of the youngest guys in here. You were 18 when you got, went in the, right out of high school into the Air Force, yeah, right? I, yeah, I couldn't understand how a guy 25 could fly an airplane. But as I got to be 25, I worried about 30-year-olds. And now that I'm 62, mm -hmm. I worry about, you know, like Ed over there. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you, you, you still, uh, no, you, you, said that, you say in the book that anybody can become a pilot, but that's, that's true to a certain extent. A lot of people can learn to fly, but I think the really 
truly great pilots have, a, have an inborn instinct, a great eye-hand coordination. Now, your vision still is, I yeah. imagine, probably 20-20. Well, I have 20 to. tenths in each eye yet, but the main thing, if you have a baseline of good visual acuity and also good eye-hand coordination, then it depends on experience. And the more experience you get, the better pilots you are. And the object's to live and get a lot of experience, yeah. naturally. <laughs> what is, what is the, I know when I first went out to try to get a pilot's license, which I did get, they, they quoted that old saying, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. True? Yeah, that, well, I don't believe a word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you flying now? You're, you're flying some ultralights, I read. Well, I, I own an ultralight, it's all I have, and but uh, like I say, I get to fly some pretty good airplanes, like the F-20, and, right. Right, and it, it's fun, and, and it's long, long as I can pass the physical, I can fly, and that's, yeah. that's the job. Would you do it all over again? Would you yeah. come back and yeah, say Yeah, sure, because it was fun to me, and uh, I learned a lot in the Air Force, you know, about it was your job and uh, what it meant to fight for your country. That's, right. uh, that's the reason they raised us. So. And you're still going to fly, though? Yeah. You've had an extraordinary life. What was the... Now, in, in the right stuff, they show that that actually happened to you. you. You took the plane in once, and they thought you were a goner, right? Yeah, well... And you walked out practically yes. on fire. The NF-104 in 63, uh, I was commandant of the astronaut school up there, and we were right. using the airplane as an altitude astronaut trainer because we could fly it up to 118,000 feet, get about a minute and a half of zero G in a pressure suit, and uh, ran out of hydrogen peroxide on the thrusters, and I ended up in a flat spin, and, oh, I wrote it. It was a no-win situation where I wrote it down to about 6,000 feet and punched out, but the thing that hurt me was that the ejection seat hit me in the face of my pressure suit, which was pressurized, and what hit me was the butt end of the rocket that had blown me out of the airplane, and that set my seals on fire in the pressure suit. Oh, we'll be right back. Stay where you are. The book is... It's a fascinating account about an extraordinary man, General Chuck Yeager. And Chuck, I thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Johnny. Nice to be here. George, you are off to... Uh, San Diego and Denver. San Diego and Denver. Thanks for being here. Tomorrow sure, night we have... Uh, right in front of me. Right in front of me? General Yeager. No, he's here tonight. Oh, right here in front of me. Arnold Schwarzenegger, outstanding flutist, flautist, Jean-Pierre Rampal, and hollering champion, Ginger McClam will all be here. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm humbled by that applause.